Sitting with us at the table, we have Dr. Glenda Baskin Glover, president at Tennessee State University and the Tennessee Titans 2024 Inspire Changemaker Awardee. Enjoy our conversation. Take a seat, get comfortable, because it's time to stay a while. I'm your host, Tommy Vincent, and I am speaking with Dr. Glover. How are you today, ma'am? Today is a good day. I'm so excited to be here to speak with you. It's a great day. And you are here at the Super Bowl, Super Bowl week, because tell us why. Well, every team, every NFL club chooses a person to receive the Inspire Change Award. And it's highly selected me. And I'm so humbled by it. <laughs> and I'm so grateful, you know. <laughs> and with that came a trip to the Super Bowl. <laughs> and once you found out I was coming, and you invited me to be on your show. <laughs> So you're receiving the Inspire Change Award. Why? Well, I believe, and based on conversations with them, it's because of my commitment to HBCUs and to higher education and things that we've been able to accomplish for the higher education arena and to develop models that will assist HBCUs around the country. Because HBCUs need assistance, they need Yes, they always need funding. They need uh, an advocacy base. They need advocates to speak up for them, to talk about the needs of HBCUs at the Capitol, the halls of Congress, uh, the state capitals, the legislators, to let them know that there are basic needs of HBCUs that just gone overlooked and they're grossly and severely underfunded. And so I took on that battle and uh, and I have been working with the Titans and they've been so supportive for HBCUs and the Tennessee State University. The biggest surprise, they told me, you're, you're our Woody this year. I said, you're kidding me. <laughs> why, why was that your personal charge to take on? Well, because I have a commitment and a passion for African-American education for students, once they, well, as they go to the high school, we sit down and talk to counselors and, and principals and, and directors of school education to let them know that here's what the requirements are because if you don't get it to them now, when they get to me as a college level, it's too late. And so, and it's so important that the education is viewed as, as what it really represents to our community. I always tell people I can take any student, any student be anywhere and make them a scholar. And so our students come to TSU and to other HBCUs with sometimes with just all they have is hope. They want a better life. First generation college students. If I can just get a college degree, I can help my family, I can get out of poverty. So we we stress on the front end doing this because on, otherwise on the back end it's prison, it's, it's more, you need to hire more social workers for the the problems is going to exist, so why not make, make education a choice as opposed to the last church? How did you get in the space where you started working in education? Was that always your plan? <laughs> Actually, it wasn't. My plan was to head up a major corporation. I want to be CEO of a Fortune 500 company. And that's what I set out to do. And, but if you live like I do in the spirit world, <laughs> you know, you listen to your God voice. It just wasn't my calling. My calling is higher education. My calling is educating African-American students to, to show them that there is a way out of this. It is to choose a career, choose a major, uh, decide what you want to do, and let us help you get there. And that's just been my passion for the last 30 years. So you talked about first generation students, you know, leading the charge of saying, I'm going to make education one of the tools that I use to propel myself forward. What would you say to someone listening who doesn't have an example of someone who pursued higher education? They're scared to death. They're concerned about all the things. How can I pay for it? I don't want to leave 
you know, home and, and walk away from taking care maybe of someone and making sure that everything is okay here or even their younger siblings mm -hmm. that they're concerned about? What would you share with them? Well, you know, oddly enough, that is our population. Mm -hmm. That's our entire population. Some students come to us knowing that they have to get a job while they're there to send money back to their families. We don't have many classes that we offer in the afternoons because most of our students, two thirds of them work in the afternoons. So if you don't have a class before two o'clock, because after that, they're going to other places. I mean, not just, I'm not saying they're going to law firms and making major decisions. They're working in places like they'll go to the mall and find a job, yes. a fast food or somewhere so they can get funds and send back home. Uh, and they, but, and they're, they're committed. What I, what I like so much about the students is that they want to participate in their family's uplifting, mm -hmm. not just for them, but for the entire family. And they're, they're, they're so committed, they're passionate about what they're doing. They will, not, they will not let this harvest pass. Yeah, they yeah. will not, because it means that much to them. So I just say to them, start determining at an early age what you want to do. And so and let people help you get there. You will always have a mentor in your household because our families don't sit around the table and talk about, let me cash in my CD to go to, go to college, or I'm going to sell some stock for you, or I'm going to the bank and get a loan. That's not who we are. We do, we teach them how to go to college. I had a program when I was international president of Alpha Kappa Alpha, where we taught students how to go to college, how to apply for school, how to come back now and get financial aid, because we can always go online and get the application process, but then it stops. Right. To come back and how to follow up, how to check with the Department of Education, how to, how to make sure that you have everything in on time when they should select you for to come back and review, almost like an audit to review, it's called verification, how to get documents in. So all of that's missing in our population. So we made a point to just help students get into college. And then once they get there, you know, we talk to teachers, you gotta be the role model. In the HBCU world, you're more than just a professor, I'm more than just a president. Sometimes I'm a role model, sometimes I'm a mentor, I'm a sponsor, I'm a social worker, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they bring me problems, I broke up with somebody. <laughs> 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 and they're crying. And I said to myself, oh, how grateful you should be, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, you are successful. You've accomplished a lot of things to date because you're not finished. Clearly, you're still working on uh, leaving your thumbprint in the earth. And as you said, you are led by what God is telling you to do. What is the accomplishment to date when you think about it that you're even blown away but by what was done? Well, I tell you, there's accomplishments and that's what, what I did know. So let me talk about the accomplishment first. I think the greatest accomplishment for any college president, and I'm no different, is to see the students walk across that stage at graduation. That is, that does so much. Then sometimes they'll tell you, thank you so much. I want to be just like you and things like that. And, and, Do you really? You know? <laughs> but, I mean, that's the greatest accomplishment. And then is a specific Tennessee State. I just think making TSU a national brand. Yes. To put them in a, on a worldwide stage, you know, we're being discussed in rooms that we had never thought about. Mm -hmm. You know, at the White House, they're calling our names. And so that to me is such an accomplishment for our university, for the Vice President of the United States to come to our campus. The first HBCU, well, the first school that she visited as a commencement speaker, so she got, after she got in office, was Tennessee State wow. University. Yeah. So it's a, it's a real honor. So we are proud of those things. And Oprah Winfrey came back to our commission speaker last year to have the relationship with, with our loves who are so key to the university. Those things are very, very special. What do you believe the greatest opposition is to you accomplishing the things that you desire to accomplish for your university? The biggest problem, or the biggest, what I didn't learn at Tennessee State as a student 
because it's not a test word. It's a level of non-acceptance that you will encounter as an accomplished black woman. That is not the expectation for you. And I have learned that, I have to learn that through the School of Hard Knocks, that it doesn't matter about your degrees. Yeah, I know I'm a lawyer and I know I'm a CPA and I can walk in the rooms and the courtrooms, I can walk into businesses and tell you what's wrong, I can analyze, I can buy a kid, I can analyze and tell you what's going on. That's, you don't have that level of respect. Um, well, it's not accepted as much because that's not the expectation of you. There's a pathway in their minds that you should, you cannot go beyond. And if you appear to be going beyond that, you become a target. The higher you, the higher you go up, decline, the more of a target you become. You know, <laughs> I talk to black women. You know, we, you know, we just sit around and talk sometimes in the corporate world, higher education, presidents, and even, and you know, provost level. We're talking about some of the issues, and we all have agreed that you become a target. The same reason they bring you into a corporation is for those same reasons they become intimidated by you later on, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> so mm -hmm. you know, I sit on corporate boards and I and I see the need for more African Americans to be in leadership. You know, I sit on the board of Pinnacle Bank and they make they make such a great effort to to be the, to have the diverse equity inclusion. It's not just a statement for them. It's a way of life for our company to make sure that people really I mean, they're really committed to having more African Americans and more women. But I don't see that everywhere I go. Sometimes it's just, it's a comment that's made, but it's not the fulfillment that needs to be out there. And so that is the, the biggest challenge I see, is that is not that level of non-acceptance that you can't get around the target you become. Right? If you're too smart in their minds, if you can, so how dare you sit here and talk to me as if you're on my equal, you know, yeah. like you're on my level. You sitting in front of me telling me I'm doing something wrong. How dare you tell me that I owe you $2.1 billion. Are you crazy? You know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's, that's what happens when you begin to speak out about injustices. And you can't be afraid ever to call racism, racism. Mm -hmm. But that's what it is, it exists. And the average racist doesn't, even believe they're racist. Mm -hmm. They'll tell you first time, but I'm not a racist, but, you know, so, so it's a but that, that makes your eyebrows raise. And so that's what you have to really be on the guard for, but not to be afraid to, to challenge. Mm -hmm. It may cost you a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it may cost you quite a bit, but you have to make a choice. Mm -hmm. you go, that's why the Me Too, Me Too movement came about. Mm -hmm. People was hush, they stayed hushed up all these years. And then finally, somebody had enough nerve to say, I can't take any more of this. I want to come forward and talk about this. And so, and therefore, the Me Too movement was born. And so that's how it has to be in women, black women leadership. You have to make the decision. You know, here's some, there are going to be some consequences. But I'm going to decide, do I choose now to, am I going to keep quiet? Or be like Moses and suffer affliction with my people, you know? <laughs> Man, I'm, I'm listening to you talk and um, <laughs> obviously I'm, I am interviewing you for this conversation. We're in conversation together, but I'm getting so drawn into, <laughs> I know that you have experience in life that I don't, and I value that. Will you share some words of wisdom with women like myself, who God willing still has the opportunity to utilize the platforms and positions that we have to leave our mark in the earth, living a purpose-filled life. And that's a wonderful conversation to have because that's what I'm doing in these days. I'm in the fourth quarter of my career. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know I've been at the 50 yard line where you may be, yeah. but now <laughs> I'm in the fourth quarter of my career. And I'm, you know, and I'm trying to let other young black professionals know that this is what you have to do. One, you have to make sure that you you, you have to believe so so firmly in yourself and know, know your self-worth and feel like there's nobody can bring you down no matter what, how much of a target you become, because you will become targeted. If you go high enough, you become a target. That's just the way the world operates. But, and, and you must, must, must have faith in God. 
no matter what else you do, you start off every day with a prayer and meditation because you know, I led two organizations at the same time. I was president of Alpha Kappa Alpha for International President and then president of Tennessee State University. And so even as I'm about to walk out into the world, I, I need your guidance, you know, because they always ask me, if you could do it over, what would you do better? What would you do differently? And I said, the first thing I would do, I would trust God sooner. You know? <laughs> I would have I would have waited till the crises moment. I would have trusted God much sooner in my career and not worry all night about this or that. I was, so I said, develop your faith in God now. So bank it away if you have to, you know. So when you get a hard time, you put it out there and say, well, Lord, you said, you said mercy now. So I need that mercy I got stored up, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so thank you for those um for that, Jim, I, I'm taking that. That's personal for me and everybody else just gets to glean from what you just shared with me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so grateful that you took time out of your time here to sit down and talk with me. And again, congratulations on your Inspire Change Award. And congratulations to you too. Thank you. Thank you. You may not know, but you have so many role models and so many young ladies. And I'm so honored to be a part of this, this, this podcast and to be on this show with you. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you.